Hello and welcome to Scientists in Action and Ode to Toad. I'm your host, Kate, from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, but today we are instead broadcasting from the Denver Zoo, one of our local neighbors here in the Denver area. We are, in fact, behind the scenes, though, in the Toad Barn, where we're going to be talking to a couple of scientists in a matter of minutes to hear a little bit about the conservation project behind saving the endangered boreal toad. For on-camera schools, I'm going to ask that you stay muted and off-camera until our open Q&A session in about 15 or so minutes, and we'll make sure to call on you so you know when to unmute and join. If you are not going to be on camera and you have questions, love it. We have an open chat. So students, teachers, whoever, as you have questions, you can go ahead and be adding them to the chat, and we'll make sure that our scientists get to hear them. Otherwise, thank you for joining us, um, and I would love to introduce both Julie and Derek. Could you tell us maybe a little bit about your role here at the museum? Or Sorry at the zoo, um, as well as maybe what we're going to be hearing about as far as toads go. So take it away. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Julie Krajewski, and I'm the Colorado Conservation Coordinator in Denver Zoo's Field Conservation Department. So I work on our local Colorado projects, mainly in the Rocky Mountains. And once our toads go into the wild and um, any toads that are already living in the wild is kind of where I focus on in our boreal toad project. And my name is Derek Kospoon. I'm a zookeeper here at the zoo in the Tropical Discovery Building. And uh, my focus is on our captive uh, re reproduction and re-release of the boreal toads uh, and everything boreal toad here at the toad bar. Very cool. So before we get to hear a little bit more about the project itself and these really cool critters that we have, in fact, in the room with us, we have a question for you, our audience. Um, let's go ahead and open that poll. And we would like you to answer, students, teachers, however you have that computing set up, why is it that we are protecting this boreal toad? Why is it worth protecting them? Is it because they play an important role in an ecosystem? Maybe once they're gone, they're gone for good and therefore just simply worth protecting? Is it because they're interesting and pretty cute or maybe something all the above? So go ahead and take a minute or so to read through these answers and place your votes. All right, take about a second more and place your vote if you've not done so already. And let's go ahead and close that poll and see how our friends did. Oh, wow, okay, across the board, it's pretty much unanimous. Everyone says it is all the above. That's the first time we've seen that today. Um, well, how do they do? Is that the answer? Is there an answer? <laughs> I would have to agree. I, I think uh, all of the above fits perfectly. They are certainly important in an ecosystem. A um, little bit more suggestive, but I, uh, subjective, but I believe they're cute as well. <laughs> Definitely. I agree. I think they're really cute. Um, and they are just another creature that we share this world with. So they do just deserve to exist, um, as, as we all do. So for all of those reasons, it's really important to try to make sure that boreal toads will continue to exist and share the state of Colorado with us. Very cool. So, so for our friends watching, um, the footage that you're seeing right now is essentially the toad cam. Um, we're just watching them in real time as they are crawling all over each other. And oh, they are about to get, it looks like a toad breakfast. This is even better. So Derek is feeding them. Are those crickets, Derek? Yeah, those are crickets that we coat with a vitamin and mineral supplement uh, just to make sure that they have all the nutrients they need uh, here at the zoo. And uh, they love them in the wild. They're pretty opportunistic feeders. They'll eat any insect or any little organism that, they, that moves and that they can fit into their mouth. But uh, here at the zoo, we mainly give them crickets as a staple with that vitamin supplement. This is so cute. They're like wiggling their feet as they eat and closing their eyes. Um, these are some happy toads, everyone. <laughs> and they're very tiny too. Um, well, I guess on that note, actually, maybe we should kind of define what is a toad? Um, what is an amphibian? Derek, do you want to take this one? Sure. An amphibian is an animal that has two distinct life phases. Uh, in fact, the word amphibian at its root comes from amphibios, which means double life. Uh, and as we know, most amphibians start their uh, life as a tadpole, which is completely dependent on water. So a pond or a lake, or there are some frogs that are even stream breeders. Uh, 
Uh, and then as they develop from a tadpole, they go through uh, an incredible change called metamorphosis and turn into their terrestrial or land uh, living life stage. Um, and that's what makes them an amphibian, having two life stages, one that is completely dependent on water. Okay. Um, and a toad and a frog, they're both amphibians, right? But are they, di are they different? How are they different? Yeah, they have quite a few differences. Frogs, uh, for the main part, their hind legs are really long and quite strong compared to their body size. And that's for hopping around and hopping and jumping to get uh, evade predators and things. Toads, on the other hand, have pretty stubby, short uh, rear legs compared to their body size. And that's because their mode of travel is mainly just crawling and walking around instead of hopping. Um, toads also have that char characteristic drier kind of warty skin as compared to frogs whose skin is usually kind of wet and slick looking. Um, and uh, because of that, toads can, can tolerate much drier habitats than frogs. Very cool. I guess that makes sense since Colorado is a pretty dry state. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Here's kind of a question um, I want to bring up that, you know, I was hearing before we did this program that amphibians are a lot of time are considered indicator species. Um, does someone want to speak to that? What does that mean to be an indicator species? Yeah, so an indicator species is something that just lets us know what's going on in the environment. And so as Derek just explained, toads and amphibians spend so much of their time in the water that they're really sensitive to what's going on in that water. Like they need to transfer oxygen and breathe through their skin. They need to get electrolytes through their skin and anything that's going into that water is gonna be affecting them. So if there's pollutants in the water, chemicals, um, anything's going on there, it's going to start to affect amphibians probably before we start to see it in any of the other animals or the other plants in the environment. So they're a good indication of what's going on. Is that pond healthy? Is that environment in general healthy? Wow. So that almost sounds kind of like a fifth reason to protect boreal toads, because from a science perspective, it's like, yeah. you know, the warning sign. I think Derek, you called them a canary in a coal mine earlier. Is that right? Yeah, they're just, they're going to be the first organisms to alert us to any uh, anything wrong in the entire ecosystem, indicating whether your entire system is healthy or not. So yeah, they're very important. And that's a very important role that they play. Wow. Whether they know it or not. <laughs> that's right. They're very they're important. Really important. Um, well, okay, let's talk about I guess then how toads are just doing overall. Um, what is the state of toads? Like, why are we conserving them, I guess? Yeah, uh, so the boreal toad specifically um, is actually a subspecies of the Western toad. And boreal toads are found throughout the Northwestern US and into Canada. Um, and in Colorado though, they're actually not doing very well. And within all of the kind of the Southern Rocky Mountains, and that's Colorado, kind of Southern Wyoming, Northern um, New Mexico, they're not doing very well. And unfortunately, a lot of that's because of habitat destruction and pollutants getting into their environment, but also this fungus called chytrid. And this fungus could affect um, amphibians all over the world, but some of them tolerate it better than others. And what happens is it gets um, kind of onto their body and it starts to affect their skin. And it makes it really difficult for them to continue to breathe or get nutrients throughout their skin. And that's so important for a toad. So unfortunately, their populations have really declined in Colorado. And now it's estimated that there's only about 800 adult boreal toads left. So since they're so widespread um, kind of in the country, they're considered to be doing okay like still still kind of risky, but okay. But here in Colorado, they're actually a state endangered species. And what that means is that within the state, we're really, really concerned about if they'll continue to be populations of boreal toads in the long term. There's just not enough individuals and not enough ones that can find each other to breed for us to feel safe about it. And so that's why Denver Zoo, in partnership with Colorado Parks and Wildlife, are devoting a lot of resources towards trying to help save the boreal toad. Wow, that sounds, yeah, like intense, you know, worth worth protecting, um, but also a little sad. So it's interesting to think um, that, you know, they might be okay in other places, but that doesn't mean that they're doing okay in Colorado. So good yep. to know. Um, well, what is the Denver Zoo doing at, specifically? You know, what is the process of conserving a toad? How does one help a species like this? Uh, so just last year, we built this dedicated space for the boreal toad with the express purpose to house them as an assurance 
colony that we call them to just make sure they continue to exist. Um, and with, with that colony, uh, the ultimate goal is to reproduce them here at the zoo uh, and then re-release those uh, offspring back to the wild to help bolster the numbers in the wild. <clears throat> Excuse me. So last year we were able to do that. We uh, reproduced the offspring here at the toad barn, but then we put them back out in the wild where they ultimately came from just to make sure that the uh, population continues to grow. Well, cool. okay, so this picture we're looking at right here, um, there almost looks like a bunch of bathtubs. What goes what goes in these tubs or what happens in this room? This is where we keep them uh, through half of the year while they're awake. Uh, the top tub in that picture is made up of a, a land portion as well as a water portion. And once we pull them out of the refrigerator where they are now, um, doing what we call brumating them or putting them through a brumation cycle, and brumation is basically uh, kind of like a lighter hibernation. They're not completely asleep. And there's a picture of the inside of the brumation chamber, which is just a industrial restaurant sized refrigerator with a very sensitive thermostat. Um, so in each of those Tupperware containers is, is a separate locality or population of toads that uh, we brought down slowly to the temperature of 36 degrees. So just a few degrees above uh, freezing. And we keep them there for about six months of the year. And uh, just in about three weeks here, we're getting ready to wake them up, we call it, and uh, put them in the, those other tubs you saw before. And hopefully they will lay eggs and reproduce and make tadpoles that we can then put back into the wild to help the wild populations. Oh, right. And that's what you're seeing here. Uh, last year, we were able to successfully reproduce them here at the Toad Barn, and here we're collecting individual tadpoles. Uh, that's Daria, another keeper from Tropical Discovery, who's very involved in the project. And uh, we're counting individuals just to make sure we know exactly how many we're putting back in the wild. And we're packaging them up here, just like a fish with oxygen injected into the water to make sure they have enough air to breathe on the way to the release site. And those are what we call metamorphs, just brand newly morphed tadpoles. You can see on the one in the middle there, he still has a little bit of tail sticking out. He hasn't fully resorbed his tail yet. Uh, and we put mostly back in the wild late stage tadpoles just before that life stage. And also just a couple of little metamorph little baby tadpoles. And that's what you're seeing there, or toads, excuse me. Wow, okay, so y'all essentially you know, have these bathtubs of toads where they, they are their little tadpoles and then they start to grow legs and they turn more into toadlets or, you know, those, we call them metamorphs. Metamorph, metamorph or okay. toadlet, yeah. And then you're putting them in bags and buckets and you're taking them up to lakes, rivers. Where are you taking them? What does that releasing process kind of look like? So it is a very long day. Um, you saw in the video, the, the early morning of that day was Derek and his team packaging up the tadpoles. And then it was probably a four or so hour drive um, to just get to our starting point. And then it was another hour drive on some really bumpy roads. And then we got to hike in carrying buckets or bags of tadpoles. And then um, we needed to get them kind of used to the environment. So we needed the temperature of the bag of water to get close to what the temperature in that pond was gonna be. And then the, the bag gets, just gets dumped out and those tadpoles are back in the wild, wow. um, ready to go and live their little tadpole lives and hopefully <laughs> metamorph and become, become adult toads who will someday breed. That is so cool. I cannot imagine hiking with bags of toads. That seems incredibly heavy and difficult. But that's so <laughs> that, that site that you're looking at is is well above 11,000 feet in elevation. So very, very high up into the high country, just barely subalpine, almost alpine. Okay. So is that one thing that's pretty defining of the boreal toad is that they live at these high alpine areas? Hi, um, it's really unusual for amphibians to live up so high. Um, in Colorado, there's actually only four amphibians that live up above 8,000 feet. Um, the boreal toad is actually the only alpine toad that we have here in Colorado. So if you happen to see a toad above 8,000 feet, it's definitely a boreal toad here in Colorado. Um, the other amphibians you might encounter up that high are a tiger salamander, a boreal chorus frog, and a wood frog. Um, but if you see a boreal toad, one of the most distinctive things it has is the stripe on its back. It's called a dorsal stripe, and it looks like almost whitish. So it's pretty distinctive. Um, but if you see a toad with that stripe and you're not in the mountains, 
it's going to be something else. So there are some other toads here in Colorado and even right around the Denver area that look a lot like boreal toads. Um, they're called woodhouses toads. And so they look a little, they look very similar. But if it's down below about 7,000, 7 or 8,000 feet, then it's not going to be a boreal toad. Um, and that, that toad right there that you were just kind of seeing was like a, not quite as big as they can get. Um, they can get to be about four to six inches, which depending upon the size of your hand, um, it's about the size of the palm of your hand. Wow, that's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I do notice you're wearing gloves in all of these. Is that for protection for you or for the toad? So it's for the toad. So as we were talking about with them being an indicator species and that uh, really sensitive skin, that's sensitive to all sorts of things. So um, the toads are sensitive to anything that we might have on our hands. So sunscreen or bug spray or lotion or anything like that. So we don't wanna get any of that into them. But even the bigger concern is that chytrid fungus that we talked about. So that fungus can be spread really through anything that's wet. So if we touch some water that happens to have chytrid fungus on it, we could get that on our hands. And we don't wanna get um, transfer that fungus to a toad. So we always make sure that we have fresh clean gloves anytime we're handling a toad in the wild. Here at the zoo, Derek's also really careful about making sure that he's not contaminating between different toads as well. Yes, <clears throat> excuse me. We, we have a dedicated set of gloves for each tank uh, to make sure we're not transferring any microbes between populations. And uh, we filter all of our water coming into the building. As you can see behind us, we have a two-stage uh, activated carbon filter, um, as well as a pH monitor to make sure the pH uh, is the, at the correct level. And that just, is another thing that goes to show why they're such a good indicator species because they're so sensitive to any of those environmental changes. If the chemical makeup of the water changes or anything environmental is wrong in your ecosystem, the toads will let us know and uh, usually are the first organisms to let us know. Wow, very cool. So at this point, um, I would like to invite uh, some of our on-camera schools to have questions. So if you could go ahead and get Monarch K-8 school, that's um, Ali. Allie Becker's class, um, to unmute and turn on your camera. Uh, we would love to see your faces as well as hear some of your questions directly. Um, so that's Allie Becker's group. If you want to go ahead and hello, good morning. Oh, we can see you. I don't know if we can hear you just yet. Right. Um, and I might recommend, so students who have individual questions, sometimes it's easier to come up to the computer just so we can hear you nice and loud. Um, since we are in a barn of toads and there's a lot of <laughs> water filters going on, but we cannot wait to hear your questions. What questions do you have for Julie or Derek? It might still be on mute. I think uh, y'all might still be muted. Um, are you, are, no, okay. No. We're not hearing you just quite yet. Um, I know we could hear you earlier. Asa, can you see him in studio? Are they unmuted? Looks like we're unmuted in oh. Zoom. Look around at our other controls here. If we're unable to get the audio working, we can always throw your questions in the chat. It's still nice getting to see your classroom. You have a very cool space. <laughs> um, so what is your first question? All right. 
And our question is, why do the frogs have to be cold? Oh, that's a great one. Oh, that's a great question. Um, these guys have to be cold just because of where the environment they live there. They live at such a high elevation. That's what they experience, you know, in their natural habitat. They can get, you'd be found in elevations in excess of 11,000 feet. So, you know, anybody who's from Colorado and been up that high know that knows that it gets very cold throughout the winter. Um, and that's what they, that's why they go into that state of brumation. Uh, that's kind of like hibernation. They just kind of slow all of their bodily functions down. Uh, their requirement for food is very little when they're brumating. Um, and we try to mimic what they go through in the wild here at the zoo. And that's why we have them in a brumation chamber throughout the winter. Very good question. That was a great question. Um, Asa, that's whose voice you're hearing. Asa's in our studio right now. Asa, do we have another question from the classroom? And we can even pull them back on camera even if we can't see them. But what's another question from the classroom? Our next question is, what is in the fungus that is hurting them? Does that fungus hurt other species? Ooh. Yeah, that's a really great question. So the chytrid fungus um, affects mainly amphibians, um, but it affects amphibians all around the world. So they be scientists believe that it originally came from Southeast Asia, that that's where this fungus was naturally occurring. So a lot of the amphibians that live there um, are doing okay with it. Like they have adapted to live with it. But a lot of amphibians in South America and North America um, are affected by it. And it varies as to if those amphibians are affected as badly as the boreal toads are, or some of them are actually able to, to live with it okay. But it does affect um, all sorts of different frogs and toads and salamanders. Great question. Oh, yeah, that would definitely be of concern. Um, Let's see, let's get at least one or two more questions from the uh, classroom from Monarch K8. If you wanna go ahead and bring them back on camera and let's go ahead and see the chat. What's another question? In the meantime, uh, there's the question, oh, are the, oh yeah, are there benefits for this toads living in high elevation? Oh, that, that's a really good question. So um, one of the things that would benefit them is that there aren't a lot of other toads and frogs living up at high elevation. So you're going to have a little bit less competition than a place that might have more, um, more toads. What, what do you think, Derek? Yeah, that's a, that's a real good point, <clears throat> as well as uh, only needing to be active for part of the year. You know, half, half the year, if not even more here in Colorado, they don't need to be active. They don't need to be evading predators or finding food. They're brumating underground, uh, which is going to ultimately prolong their life and have a better chance of survival yeah. in the wild. Yeah, but like with anything, that also comes with trade-offs. Um, so since they need to brumate in the winter, that means that these toads, they breed usually in kind of like May or June, and then those tadpoles need to get big enough and metamorph um, and yeah, get, get large enough to be able to survive that first winter. And so it's a pretty short, pretty short season before you need to go and find a place to brumate. Interesting. So if you want to be a lazy toad, maybe you could be a toad <laughs> that has to hibernate, yeah. although the rest of your year might be a little bit very short frantic, and frantic, fast. getting all done at once. <laughs> um, let's see, we have two more questions from Ali Betcher's crew uh, I see in the chat, and then we'll go ahead and we'll turn it over to our other on-camera school. So the next question from the crew is, when did scientists first discover this problem? And I'm assuming they're talking about the fungus, um, the chytrid fungus. When did they first find that this was a thing? Um, so I don't know about like chytrid in general. And again, like it has been something that's been occurring naturally in places for a long time. But I know here in Colorado, we really started to realize that it was affecting the boreal toad about in the 1980s. That's when we started to see big declines. So it used to be that you could go out to these towns in the mountains and under a street lamp, you would just see hundreds of toads. 
Um, and now, now toads are so scarce in Colorado that it's really difficult to find them at all. Um, so, so yeah, so it's been about, you know, probably close to 40 years now that, that it's been affecting our toads here in Colorado. Yeah, and in the late mid eighties, there were populations in Costa Rica and Central and South America of frogs and toads just disappearing. And at the time they didn't really know that it was Kitchard. And then after learning about Kitchard going back, kind of revealed that's what happened. Kitchard was there before we even knew what Kitchard was. Wow, that's pretty, pretty wild, you know. Just goes to show that the more we know and the more we learn in science, kind of the more things even in the past can make sense. Um, the last question from Ali Betcher's crew um, is, will this project help these toads become less endangered? Yeah, we certainly hope so. So, so that is our goal. We are hoping that, um, like Derek said, we can have an assurance population of these toads, but also keep getting toads back out in the wild to get their numbers up, but also to just help them survive um, here in Colorado in the long term. We said there are some toads and amphibians that have developed more of a resistance or a tolerance to living in environments with chytrid. Fortunately, right now, boreal toads in Colorado aren't there yet, but we're hoping that if they can continue to stay in Colorado for a long time, eventually they'll develop um, that resistance and a science advance. Scientists like you guys can help us find more solutions. So that's, that's the goal of our project is to make sure that they will continue to stay in Colorado and hopefully someday no longer be on our state endangered species list. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and certainly boreal toads lay several thousand eggs at a time. So if, if here at the toad barn, we can figure out how to get most of those to survive to a, a tadpole stage, our goal is to be releasing thousands, if not tens of thousands tadpoles at a time to help wild, wild populations persist and grow. Yep, and while that sounds like a really big number, um, everything likes to eat boreal toads. So if we put out thousands of tadpoles into the wild, most of those are going to be eaten by something or maybe not survive for, for other reasons. And very few of those will actually make it to an adult toad into a breeding toad. And that's part of why it's so important to use expertise like Derek has with breeding toads to be able to continue to have a whole bunch of toads that are in tadpoles that are going into the wild each year. Very cool. Those were such amazing questions. Um, thank you so much, Monarch K-8 Elementary School. Um, Allie, Allie Becker's crew. Um, yay, <laughs> I, I, a bummer that we couldn't hear you, but it was great to see your faces and in your classroom. And thank you again for your questions. Um, at this point, I would love to invite uh, Rochelle Crumpet's crew uh, from Mesa Elementary School on camera. If we could have you unmute and join us on camera, we cannot wait to hear your questions as well. So that's Crumpex crew from Mesa Elementary. Hello, we can see you. Let's see. Can Hi, you can you us? hear us too? Yes, we can hear we can you. Hear. Oh, that's amazing. Awesome. All right, we have some um, kiddos lined up for questions. Yes, can't How wait. old can the toads be? How old? How old? How old? Um, yeah. In, at the zoo and the breeding facility down in Alamosa, they have some that have lived up to over 20 years. Uh, in the wild, it's kind of hard to tell, tell because like Julie said, there's a lot of other animals that like to eat the toads. So we don't really know exactly how long they'll survive in the wild, but um, in facilities, it can be in excess of 20 years. So That's pretty cool. long time. Yeah. Okay. Those, those toads are old enough to have a driver's license. <laughs> <That's pretty cool. laughs> yeah, yeah, that was definitely a surprising fact when I first heard that, because um, that, that's pretty old for a tiny, tiny little toad like that. Good question. Great question. What's another question from the classroom? What would happen if the temperature was higher than 36 Fahrenheit when they hibernate? Ooh. Oh, another good question. Well, um, what would happen since toads take on the temperature of their surroundings, they would be at that temperature as well and they would keep needing energy. But since we're not feeding them, they wouldn't be taking in food and getting energy. So they would lose weight and lose weight and lose weight. And that would not be good for them. So it's important that we get them below that temperature to where all of their needs are slowed down. Their energy needs are much slower. So we don't have to feed them and they don't move much. So they don't need much energy. Um, so it's important that we get them cold enough because we keep them cold so long that they don't need energy basically. Um, and if it was warmer, they would be warmer and they would need energy and food. 
Yep. And of course, here at the zoo, we could keep the toads warmer, we could feed them all winter, but what's really important to us is that we try to replicate their natural life, um, the same life that they would be having out in the wild. So for boreal toads, that means brew mating for a big chunk of the year. So that's what we do here at the zoo as well. And correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't the like temperature also kind of a concern for other animals that maybe brumate or hi hibernate, right? Like some of them are maybe waking up earlier at times when they shouldn't be awake and there isn't food. Is that right? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Um, yeah. Um, when they come out of brumation, it has to coincide when other insects are starting to move and be available for food. So yeah, a lot of those uh, sequences are timed in nature to make sure predator and prey can coexist. Yeah, and um, as climate change kind of throws off our environment a little bit, sometimes animals, if they can't stay as cold as they need to be, they wake up just like little bits, and that just, they have to expend some calories then and some energy, and if you keep waking up like a little bit when you're supposed to be not spending any energy, it's going to make it, you know, you're going to be weakened, and you're going to be, have a lot harder time surviving once you do kind of come out of it completely. Well, that was a really good question from the classroom. Um, what is another? What else do you all want to know from Derek or Julie? Um, when and how did the fungus start? Ooh, when and how did the fungus start? Yeah, start. Um, so I don't know if scientists know that for sure. Um, uh, as far I as say. I know, yeah, it's like a, a naturally occurring fungus, um, but that used to be in just one part of the world. But as humans travel all over the world and we, we take ships and planes and all sorts of stuff everywhere and all of our, our stuff with it, sometimes we bring funguses or diseases or bacteria with us. So um, the fungus spread probably somehow with humans traveling to new places. And then it got into animals that just don't have any immunity or resistance built up to it. Um, so the fungus can spread on anything that gets wet so that's actually a reason why it's really important to make sure that we are not spreading the fungus um, to new places. So when, when my team goes out into the field to look for boreal toads, we make sure that we're going out with all clean gear, that our, our boots are clean, our shoes are clean. Um, we're not setting a backpack down where it's going to get wet and then um, taking it to another place where it's going to get wet. We want to make sure that um, if we get that fungus on our shoes, that we don't spread it to another place. So we will disinfect our gear in between different wetlands. And this is something that actually you guys can do if you're going out anywhere where you're getting to a lake or a pond, a wetland, a stream, um, you wanna make sure to clean all of your stuff off before you go to the next pond. Because just in case there's chytrid on your, your shoes or your hiking poles or your fishing gear, you don't wanna spread that to the next place that might not have chytrid. So just cleaning it with a little bit of dilute bleach, get your parents to help you, um, and then you can make it safe and make sure that we're not gonna continue to spread this. And it's also something that probably may have just always existed in this system, but as amphibians are indicator species, it is used to exist in balance, but something has changed in the environment, <clears throat> excuse me, that let the fungus kind of have an, or get an advantage. And that's why amphibians are such important indicators species. Uh, something has changed in that environment that uh, the fungus has now got the upper hand and the amphibians are letting us know that something is out of balance. Great question. I love that it also allowed y'all to tell us a little bit how maybe we as non-scientists can, can help. Um, what are more questions from the classroom? Um, what's the normal amount of eggs supposed to be laid? Ooh, I don't think I caught that. Something I'm sorry, about the, eggs being laid. The the fridge that the frogs are sleeping on just turned on a little bit and it made a noise. Could you repeat that question? She wondered what's the normal amount of eggs that would be laid. Uh, that's that's a very good question. Um, one of the strategies toads take and amphibians take is to lay a whole bunch of eggs knowing that not too many are going to survive into the next year's population. So. Boreal toads, a big adult female, can lay anywhere between two to 3,000 eggs at one time. Um, but that's her knowing that not many of those are going to survive, so it's kind of a numbers game. They, they lay a lot knowing that only a few are going to make it into the population, so quite a few. But that's an advantage to a facility like the toad barn because in a facility, we can try to make sure more of those eggs do survive and then 
more that would have survived in the wild survive here and can be reintroduced into the wild population. But a lot of eggs at one time. A lot of babies. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't isn't kind of the rule of thumb like the more babies you have, probably the less attention the parents give to those babies after they're hatched or born and if you only have a few babies, maybe you take care of them differently. Is that correct? Yep. It's all about where where that female can spend her energy or where those parents can spend their energy. Um, and toads seem to spend it on having many, many eggs um, so that they're playing that numbers game as opposed to taking like spending time taking care of their little tadpoles or their toadlets. There's very few amphibians that will exhibit some parental care, but uh, most reptiles and amphibians are on their own right from the beginning. Very independent. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, Derek, you mentioned earlier about eggs, because um, we were looking at those kind of like bathtub structures in the other room. You were saying when toads lay eggs, they lay them differently than frogs do, correct? So correct. if we were to see eggs in the wild, we might be able to know if it was a toad or a frog. Correct. If the eggs are laid kind of in a rope or a strand in a very linear rope-like fashion, those are toad eggs. Uh, frog eggs are more, more of a clump and look like a big ball, a bunch of grapes, a big ball of eggs instead of, uh, instead of in a long string or rope. Very cool. Yeah. Sounds like another cool thing to keep an eye out for. Sure. Out in the wilderness. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and get at least one or two more questions from the classroom. Um, why do you release the toads in Utah instead of Colorado? I don't know if we lost oh. you, but I cannot. I got that one. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we got that. Um, so she asked why we release the toads in Utah and not Colorado. Um, and actually, we release them in both places. Okay. So um, as we've talked about before, maybe you saw with like all the different bathtubs, we keep the toads separate based on where they came from. So we have some toads that originally came from Utah. Um, and then those toads breed, and then those little tadpoles and toadlets go back to Utah. And the ones that originally came from Colorado um, are kept separate, and even different locations in Colorado are kept separate. And then once those tadpoles are born, they'll go back to different places in Colorado. As a matter of fact, the video you saw of the release earlier, that was in Colorado. Uh, we work in collaboration and partnership with CPW, Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Um, and the, their facility for boreal toads in Alamosa. So those pictures there, are, that is a Colorado location. Uh, so we'll help boreal toads no matter where they're from and try to <laughs> help their wild populations. But we do do them both in Colorado and uh, Utah at this point. Very cool. All right, let's steal one last question from the classroom. Um, how long did it, does it take for boreal toads to metamorphosize? Ooh. That's another very great question. Um, with ectotherms, amphibians and toads being ectotherms, meaning they don't produce their own body heat and they, they take on the temperature of their surroundings, the rate at which they grow and metamorphose is going to depend on the temperature that we keep them. Um, here at the toad barn and even in the wild, it'll take probably about 30 days, 30 days a little bit longer to go through their complete from an egg to a tiny little toadlet uh, and metamorphosis. Um, but that can be a little bit slower, or a little bit longer, depending on the temperature. In the wild, they're, of course, um, at the mercy of the weather. It could be an extra long uh, spring or winter, or you can get a, a winter storm in the middle of spring. Um, so it just depends mainly on the temperature, but roughly about a month and a little bit longer. Good question. Very cool. Well, thank you for those incredible questions. Um, those were amazing. We got to hear so much cool information because of them. Uh, we have a couple of questions from the chat. I'm going to throw your way. Um, one is how long does it take to find a toad? So if we're thinking about <laughs> conservation efforts, how, how long does it take to just find them in the, in the wild actually? Yeah. So toads are really difficult to find in the wild, um, especially because there are so few. So there are some places in Colorado still where toads are breeding well, um, and then it's still tricky to find them because they're pretty small and they live um, in the water or on the ground in bushes underneath vegetation. And as you saw, like they've got some pretty good camouflage going on. Um, but lots of places that we're looking for boreal toads when we go out into the wild are places that we're not sure if they're there. It's places that we know boreal toads used to live, but we don't know if they're still living there. 
places that look like they would be a really great place for a toad to live, but we need to go and check it out. So we go and many times we don't see any toads, um, but still because they're so hard to find, we can't say for sure they're not there. We just got to keep looking and keep looking. Um, and so it can be it can be tricky, but we did find a toad at a place last year where they hadn't been seen for years and years. And so that was very exciting to be able to find toads at a, at a new place. Very cool. Um, so earlier you mentioned, I think Julie, you said this, that pretty much anything would want to eat a toad. So how do they protect themselves? Yeah, so um, amphibians and I guess toads especially have this really cool, these cool glands um, that can produce some toxins that discourage predators from wanting to eat them. And so it's these, these little glands that are kind of right behind, behind their eyes, kind of behind where the ears would be on a toad. Um, and they produce some toxins in boreal toads. It doesn't seem to be particularly strong. Like it's not something that um, is really dangerous to humans, but it does discourage predators from eating them. But still pretty much everything will eat a boreal toad. So it can't be that bad. Um, there are also a lot of predators that have gotten really smart about figuring out ways to get around that. So sometimes that actually means that they'll flip a toad over um, and, and start eating it through its belly, which is a little bit safer. That's not where the toxin is being produced. Interesting. Yum. <laughs> <laughs> um, so kind of on the, on the note of like predators and eating toads too, are there other species that have been directly impacted by this kind of decline in toads? Sure. Anything that might depend on toads as a food source is going to be impacted. Um, other animals that the frogs eat, like uh, bugs, mosquitoes, you know, insects that aren't really necessarily ones that we want around, they'll increase in numbers because there's fewer boreal toads and frogs and uh, to eat them. So yeah, every, every organism in an ecosystem or a food web has its place. And when one goes missing, it throws the whole thing out of balance and it's not a good thing. Good to consider. Um, and kind of the, the last question I want to throw your way from the chat, um, I'm going to kind of combine two. So one question is saying how boreal refer, refers to a forest, right? So does this have, like, how does this play into the, the way that the toads are named? Um, and then also, do these toads live typically near streams or ponds? Like, where do they live? And what does that word boreal kind of mean as far as their naming overall? Yeah, um, yeah, so these toads are often found kind of in, in foresty environments. So generally between eight to 12,000 feet. Um, so that's still typically, you know, below tree line here in Colorado. Um, and they need a lot of moisture in the ground. So they, they spend part of their life in the water, but then they do need to get on ground and travel. And boreal toads can actually travel like a mile and a half between their breeding ponds and where they're gonna hibernate or brumate for the winter. And so they still need it to be moist kind of in that environment as they're moving through it. And generally that happens more so like in foresty areas. Um, and then toads are looking for some kind of specific requirements to be able to, to breed. And that tends to be places that there hopefully aren't many fish because fish will definitely eat boreal toads. Um, and that the water is shallow enough that it can be warm enough for the tadpoles to develop, um, but also a slope where boreal toads can get out of the water once they've metamorphed and are tiny little toadlets who can't really jump very well. Um, and so that ends up being things like beaver ponds or old beaver ponds, uh, wet meadows, sometimes like they tend to not live right like in a fast moving stream. But if there's a little bit of like a backwater by a stream, you'll find them in those places. Um, and then definitely ponds, they can live in lakes, but again, lots of fish like to eat them. So a big deep lake with lots of fish is probably not a great place for them. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. Uh, beaver ponds that uh, the ponds that beavers create with their dams are a very important breeding habitat for boreal toads. And in reference to the name, I believe, and I'm not positive about this, but boreal is kind of re referring to the montane nature of those forests. They're kind of at altitude, they're higher, and uh, that's one of the most unique aspects of the boreal toad is that it does occur at such a high altitude. So really good, uh, really good question. Very cool. <clears throat> well, we are almost out of time, which is so sad. I just could look at these toads and talk about toads all day. Um, this is amazing. Y'all have a great job here at the zoo. Um, is there anything you want to leave our students on today as far as how maybe they can be involved or become scientists or, you know, what would you like to have your final message to the students be? 
Yeah, so we all play a role in helping boil toads. And one of the biggest ways that that is, is through making sure that their water is there and is healthy. So it's important for us all to conserve water in our homes, in our schools, just everywhere we go. Um, and then also to keep that water clean. So to make sure that we're really thoughtful about anything that's going into the water. So chemicals, pollutants, anything like that is something that we all need to do to make sure that boreal toads um, can continue to have a healthy place to live. Yeah, and if you could just even share awareness or what you learned today with others about an amphibian that does live that high in the mountains. Not many people even know that amphibians can live that high. So if you like them and like the high country yourselves, just let other people know that they're up there and uh, they're worth protecting and they need protection. Yeah, and if you're spending time in the high country, um, make sure that you're again cleaning your stuff, going between pond to pond, so that you're not helping or that you're not contributing to spreading that fungus. Very cool. Well, you heard it. Go out there, be advocates for for wildlife because these toads are very cute and very important and definitely worth protecting. Um, so thank you, our classrooms, and as well as the, the folks in the chat who asked amazing questions today. Thank you, of course, Derek. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Kim and Asa, who you can't see because they're off camera doing all the technical work making this amazing program happen. Um, this has been so exciting. If you enjoyed today's program, we hope you will come back for another. We have one more this academic school year, um, Scientists in Action Visualizing Animal Acoustics, and which will actually be going to Bluff Lake Nature Reserve, which is kind of in the Denver area. And we'll be looking a little bit about how scientists know what animals do when we're not necessarily watching them or paying attention. Um, so that should be pretty fun. There are also a number of programs for teachers and students. Um, even throughout the summer that folks can sign up for here at the Denver Zoo. So make sure to check out those resources if you live here in the Colorado area. Um, otherwise, my name is Kate. Thank you again for joining us. Classrooms who joined us, if you want to go ahead and unmute, we would love to say goodbye to you. And we'll definitely be seeing you next time. So have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.